The key topics that we'll cover uh, in the webinar today is we'll talk about software part integrity and specifically uh, how that is supported and insured with ARINC 665 loadable software parts or LSPs. So ARINC 665 uh, addresses the, the topic of uh, software part integrity. Uh, then we'll talk about what's, what's really what's kind of new, like the central kind of driving item in, in this technical area today. And that's digitally signed software parts. And those are, are uh, defined, the ways of doing that and the specification for that is defined in a standard called ARINC 835. And what ARINC 835 does, it, it ensures software part authenticity. So it it is primarily providing a mechanism where a receiver of a loadable software part going to an aircraft has a standardized way to ensure that that part came from who, who the receiver thought it came from, that it's authentic, that if it's a part for a Honeywell LRU or for uh, an, um, a software part that's coming from Boeing, that when that part's received, when it's been transmitted electronically to the recipient, you know, most notably the operators, that there's a way to ensure that that part really did come from Boeing or really did come from Honeywell or any other LRU uh, manufacturer who would produce that software part and that that those source parties of the software aren't um, aren't being impersonated uh, a, a, as a way of giving malicious software uh, to an operator that somehow would make its way into an aircraft. So that's what we mean by software part authenticity, and that'll be kind of the core of, of the talk today. And then we'll talk a little bit about how Airing six six five loadable software parts, and then also the digitally signed 835 parts, how they're uh, handled and, and actually used out at the portable data loader, and then finally the final step from the portable data loader onto the aircraft uh, system during the load process. So those are the topics we'll cover today. Uh, so first, we'll talk uh, briefly about the Airing 665 loadable software parts. I'm going to keep this pretty brief. Uh, if you didn't attend uh, our previous webinar back in December, I think we cover Airing 665 in a little more detail. Um, the point here is to just explain how the 665 LSPs are ensuring software part integrity today. So uh, as I said, it, it, that's the standard that provides the mechanisms to ensure that the loadable software has integrity. Uh, what we mean by integrity is that the part hasn't been altered or changed or um, um, corrupted uh, since it was packaged into a loadable software part. So um, ARINC 665 provides some cyclic redundancy checks that are calculated over each individual file in a software part and then also over the whole collection of files, one big CRC. And so it provides a standard way of encoding and communicating those CRCs so that the recipient can check and compare to the CRCs that were calculated by the packager of the part. Uh, an ARINC 665 LSP, the contents are pretty simple. Uh, I'm just showing a screenshot of a, uh, of a file folder or a, a subdirectory that contains a software part. Uh, basically what you have is the collection of load files. So those are any binary file that are specific and proprietary to the LRU that need to get loaded into the LRU. Uh, and then associated with, with all of those load files, there is the LSP header file. And so that LSP header has a, a file extension of a .luh, and the format and content of that file is specifically what's defined in ARINC 665. <clears throat> if we look here at it, kind of an overview of what the contents of that header file, the LSP header file are. Uh, what I'm showing you here is a screenshot from uh, one of our media uh, and loadable software part editor tools. So it's kind of a graphical representation of what's in uh, a header file when you load it up into one of our tools. So kind of at the top of the, <clears throat> of the LSP header file, you have the part number associated with the loadable software part. So that is the part number for the whole collection of load files that are packaged as the software part. And then also at that top level, you have an integrity check of the whole LSP. So it's a CRC. In our tool here, we're showing uh, not actually the CRC, uh, but what we're showing you is the, the type of CRC. 
So if the latest uh, variant of Airing 665 is used, uh, dash 3 or later, uh, there is the ability to select and use several different CRC types. So in this case here, we're showing that for this loaded uh, LSP, that the LSP uh, checksum uses a 32-bit CRC. But there's, there's multiple methods, including SHA-1, MD-5, that can also be selected depending on uh, kind of the overhead that you're willing to deal with in order to get a, a higher level of integrity checking uh, capabilities. Then also, the software part has a list of one or more target hardware IDs. So again, if you participated in the previous um, webinar that we had, that kind of looked at some of the protocol details of Airing 615A, um, in that, what we, what we talked a little bit about is that every LRU or avionics system um, that is loadable using 615A has assigned to it and embedded in it a target hardware ID. And so that target hardware ID also gets embedded in the software parts that are intended to be loaded to that system. So what this allows is uh, at the data loader side, when a data loader connects to an LRU, it can query the LRU to ask the LRU to provide its target hardware ID. And then the data loader can ensure that the operator, the human operating the, the, the portable data loader, is not able to select a software part that doesn't have that target hardware ID embedded in it. So it's a method on the data loader side of ensuring that parts not intended for an LRU don't mistakenly get attempted to be loaded to that LRU. And then, and then also the LRU can protect itself from this. When it receives a software part, it can crack open and check that list of target hardware IDs and ensure that its ID is in that list and it can reject the part if it's not. So that's what the target hardware ID is. That's a field in the header file um, of the, the LSP. Then what you have is the list of all the load files. And for each load file, uh, there's also a part number that can be assigned and also a, a CRC or some kind of a checksum that's calculated uh, over each of the, the load files that are part of that software part. So, um, so that's, that's how the header file, that header file is going to travel around with the software part. It's even going to be the first file that gets loaded into the target LRU on the aircraft during an upload operation. And we'll talk, talk a little bit more about that process and how, how the header file is used and kind of sequenced in during the load operations uh, later in the presentation. So one, one key thing here, and this is the lead into the next part, kind of the core of the webinar, is ARIC 665 LSPs cannot be used to ensure authenticity. So there's, there's nothing in here that allows a recipient or a holder of this part to do any kind of verification or authentication uh, that this part truly came from a specific known uh, source entity. All, all you can do is check the part against the CRCs in the header file, and you can, you can know that the, uh, the header file or the constituent parts weren't changed since the header file that you have was created. So, Authenticity, enter digitally signed software parts. So kind of laying the groundwork here, one of the first key concepts um, that is used or that you need to understand to, to uh, kind of get your arms around the digitally signed software part concept is the idea of encryption key pairs. So asymmetric key pairs um, are kind of the core of digitally signed software parts. And what an asymmetric key pair is, um, is it's a pair of keys that work together such that one of the keys can be used um, to decrypt what the other key is used to encrypt. So if you have an, your encryption algorithm and you have a public-private key pair um, or an asymmetric key pair, um, the key that is used to create the encryption um, can only be unlocked by the other key in the pair and vice versa. So um, the concept of public and private uh, comes from the fact that typically when you're using asymmetric key pairs, one key is held private. So one party wants to hold that private and, and securely handle it and make sure that no one else has access to the, that private key. And then the other key is public. And so you can use the public and private keys for sort of two main um, 
two main functions or, or, or things to do. So in the first case, you would take that public key, that key that you're exposing and that everyone can know about, and you're going to use that to encrypt, and then you're going to use the private key, the key that's held private by one party to decrypt. And when you do this, uh, this is used for private communications. So um, a receiving party can hold a private key, and they can publish their public key to anybody that wants to send them a private message. So what that means is anybody who has access to that public key can encrypt a message and send it to the receiver, but only the receiver has that private key that can unencrypt and read the message. So it's, it's a way to uh, transmit and receive private messages that only the receiving party can read after they've been encrypted. So that's use one. That's not the use case or the, the mechanism that's used in digitally signing software parts. It's the latter use two. And in that case, the signer or the encryptor holds the, the, the private key. They, they keep the key used to encrypt um, the information. They keep it held privately. And that allows them to ensure that um, the receivers who have the public key know that if they could decrypt with the public key that that the signer or the encryptor had to be the party that holds the private key. So it's used as a way of, of, identi of identifying the source or authenticity of, of some entity, some signed or encrypted entity. So that's the uh, basic concept that's used with uh, loadable software parts and digitally signed software parts as shown in the, the flow there. So in that case, if you had a sender or a creator of a software part, um, they would put that software part and their uh, private E as input to a signature algorithm uh, that would sign that software part with a digital signature. And then they would make publicly available their, um, their the other set end of the key, the public key. And so then anybody who receives that signed software part, if they have access to that public key, they can use it to uh, check that digital signature or that, that encrypted uh, hash that's associated with the signed part, and and by that uh, mechanism, they would ensure uh, that the the identity of the sender of of the software part. Okay, so a little bit about PKI infrastructure. Uh, I'll go back where we're headed. Here is okay. This is all nice and cool, but what happens if somebody intercepts this signed? Uh, software part in the middle here creates their own key pair and uh, somehow gets that public key to the recipient and they change the software and sign it with their private key. Um, so there's still, I guess, a loophole in the identity issue there. So enter the PKI infrastructure. So digital certificates um, hold public keys and they're used to ensure the identity of the software provider or, or the signer of the software part. How this works in the, the realm of, of signing software parts is that a software provider will, uh, the first thing they'll do is they'll create a key pair. They'll then request a certificate from a third party um, called a certificate authority. And in that request for a certificate, they'll provide their public key and also identifying information or their identity information. The certificate authority will then combine that, um, that public key and the, uh, the requesting uh, software provider's identification into a digital certificate. Uh, and they will sign that di digital certificate with their own key pair and provide that back to the software provider. <clears throat> that digital certificate will also include the identification uh, of the certificate authority. And that is so that the software provider can provide that digital certificate to receivers of the software parts. And those software uh, receivers can use that um, certificate authority as an independent third party to verify the identity of the software provider and identify that that software provider does have a valid certificate from the certificate authority and that they are who they say they are. So that's a little bit about the PKI infrastructure that's used in the system. Um, when we talk about signing and distributing the software parts, um, so at the core of this, we have to have a signing tool. Um, the, um, the 
the software provider or the signer of the software will put the unsigned loadable software part. So in this case, or in in, in the case of Arink 835 and, and what we're talking about, that would be uh, an Arink 6, 6, 5 loadable software part. So all the load files with the LUH file. Also, as input to that signing tool for the signing process, the uh, signer would provide their private key. So their private key of the, the public private key pair would be used uh, to create the signature. The signing tool would then uh, use those two inputs and create a signed software part. Uh, that software part with its signature could then be provided to the receivers. So in most cases, this would be an operator of an aircraft who has to load that part onto some system on the aircraft. The software signer also has to make available and distribute to the receiver of the signed part their certificate. So the certificate that they received that was generated by the third party certificate authority um, previously. Um, and so that, together with that signed part and the certificate, uh, which has the public key in it, the receiver is able to verify the authenticity of the signature and also verify the identity uh, by going back to the CA who is identified also in the signer certificate and, and basically use that CA to ensure the identity of the software provider. Um, one kind of note here is I'm showing this kind of as a conceptual flow in the diagram. In most cases, this uh, signer certificate that's provided to the receivers, it's actually embedded into the signature file or into the signed software part package. It's not provided separately. Um, in almost all cases, it's actually embedded into the signature file, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. So usually when you receive a signed software part inside that signed software part, you have the, um, the certificate of the signer. If we talk a little bit about kind of real world or applications, uh, signing tools that are out there and available to use. So Boeing um, provides its CSCT. So that's the configuration item uh, signer creator tool. They provide that tool to uh, operators of their aircraft and that tool specifically can be used to uh, create signed software parts in accordance with Arink 835. So a little bit about Arink 835. It, provides kind of a framework for a high level concept of how uh, software parts should be signed and what, what formats and what kind of items should be included in the, the digitally signed software parts. And then it breaks into three sections that describe in detail three methods of actually doing the software part signing. Um, one of those methods is provided by a company called Carillon. Uh, they sign their parts. So uh, what I have here is how you can kind of identify which method uh, very quickly by looking at the signed software part. Um, so with the Carillon method, that is actually an Arink 827 crate. So it has a crate.xml setting next to the loadable software part or the 665 loadable software part. Um, it's always provided within a zip file. So it's a single zip file. Uh, at the root of the zip file is this uh, the crate.xml, which includes the digital signature and also the signing certificate, uh, the signer certificate in that XML file. And then it actually has the, the contents of the software part. If you see a software part that has a signature.xml at the root folder or the root directory of the software part, that would identify a software part that was signed using the Boeing CSCT tool or the Boeing method. Um, and then, so that XML file also includes the digital signature and the certificate, uh, the signer certificate embedded in that part. Then Airbus also has a method. So this is covered in a, a full section in detail in Arink 835. And if you have a software part, a way to identify if it was digitally signed using the Airbus method or Airbus tool chain, uh, you would find what's called a secure header file or an LSH in the root folder of the software part. And what Airbus did is they took basically the uh, LUH format or the Arink 665 header file format and they extended it to hold fields that are needed uh, to hold digital signatures and the accompanying certificates, et cetera. So that's some of the tools that are available out there and the methods. Uh, and if you have a software part that is signed, how you can identify which method was used to sign it.
Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, validating the digitally signed parts and also rev revocation of certificates. So, like we said uh, previously, the receiver of the software part uses the signer's certificate, which includes uh, the public key and a reference to the cert certifying authority or the certificate authority to verify that part. Um, the signer's identification and also the CA's identification um, are part of what's called the trust chain. We'll talk about that in a couple more slides, but that's basically a hierarchy of, of trust. So I'm showing a pretty simple figure here where we show kind of a, a direct uh, one, I guess, line type of relationship between a certificate authority and a software part signer or a requester of a digital certificate. But in um, in reality, it's, it's a more complex situation than that. There can be um, a hierarchy of certificate authorities where there's um, a root authority at the very top and then e intermediate or intermediary certificate authorities kind of between that root and um, and the actual signer and and also the receiver of the software parts. Um, it's a fairly complex topic that is probably a whole nother webinar in and of itself. So in this case, um, we're primarily just considering the certificate authority as a single entity rather than kind of a, a cloud of a hierarchy of, of intermediaries up to a root CA. Um, so just a little clarification there. Uh, what happens if the signer's private key becomes compromised? So say uh, the signer has generated its key pair, given its public key to a CA who's then produced a certificate um, back to that software part signer, and now they're producing signed parts and distributing it, you know, to different aircraft operators, et cetera. And then say that the software part signer's um, network or system is breached and a malicious party gets a hold of their private key, and that malicious party is now able to generate uh, signed software parts with a digital signature that appears to have come from the software signer. So you have to have a, mechani a mechanism to essentially revoke the signer's certificate in the case this would happen. There, that's what uh, a CRL, or a certificate revocation list, is used for. Um, Providing those revocation lists is also uh, a function of the certificate authority or the certificate authority hierarchy. So what would happen in that case if, if the software signer's digital, um, sorry, private key was compromised, is that signer would then inform the certificate authority that that, um, that specific key pair has been compromised, and then the certificate authority would issue an update to the revocation list. Uh, to indicate that that particular certificate has been revoked. Um, the, re the revocation list, I'm showing a picture of, of uh, an actual CRL list here, um, showing it in the Windows uh, CRL tool. Really, it's, it's very simple. It's a list of uh, signer certificates serial numbers. So when a, when a CA generates a, a signer certificate, it gets a unique serial number that uniquely identifies that specific um, signer certificate so that it can be revoked by simply placing the, uh, the serial number of that certificate in a CRL. So checking and getting updated CRLs is a responsibility of the receiver of the software parts. Uh, they have to ensure that they've checked and made sure that they haven't received a part um, whose certificate was previously revoked and therefore there's a possibility that that could be a counterfeit part. <clears throat> um, there are some of the three signature methods, specifically the Carillon and the Airbus method, that add a verifiable timestamp into the digital signatures. So uh, that's one of the things those specific to those two methods. And so what they do is they actually go out to another certifying authority, a timestamp authority, um, when they actually sign the part. So the signer has a network connection. They go out to a third party that provides a timestamp with a, a digital signature around it that that timestamp authority can validate. Um, and then that timestamp is embedded into the signature of the software part. What that allows uh, to happen is at the receiver, you know that at the time, which is included in, in the, the digital signature, that that signature was created. Um, that the signer had a valid um, 
had a valid certificate. But what this allows is, is that if a, if a certificate is, is somehow expires or is, is revoked, um, it's still possible for the receiver to validate and use a software part signed with that certificate because it has a timestamp and it allows the receiver to determine if the signer's signature, um, sorry, signing certificate was valid at the time the signature was created. So that's that's one of kind of the key features or key distinguishers in the Carillon and Airbus method of, of digitally signing. Um, it provides an easier mechanism to have what are called long-live uh, signed software parts. Um, so they, they can live for quite some time even if the original um, the original signing certificate was somehow compromised at some point in time after that particular part was signed. Okay, look kind of step by step, step about how, um, you know, what actually goes on in the signing tool when we're creating a, a signature file um, and then verifying it. So first we'll look at creating a signature. So on the left here, you have the actual source LSP. So the unsigned LSP. Um, a hash is created over that LSP. Uh, so depending on the, the signing mechanism, there's some mathematical algorithm that's used to create a hash uh, by, by running all of the bits and bytes of the whole LSP through it. That hash is then encrypted with the signer's private key. And then that encrypted um, hash is what goes into the signature file. So it would be a crate.xml if it is the Carillon method, a signature.xml if the signature file is created using the Boeing method in format, or an LSH if it's the Airbus. Then also that signature file contains some information like part numbers, etc., about the original LSP. And then in all three cases, um, the signer's certificate is also embedded into that signature file. Then that signature file just sits next to the unaltered Arian 665 LSP, and that is the, that is what constitutes the signed software part that is provided to the receivers. Uh, when a receiver gets the LSP, how do they verify the authenticity of it? So um, they have the signature file and then the unaltered LSP. So the first thing that the receiver does is based on the method that was used to create the signature file. Um, and they, they, the receiver can determine that based on the signature file, whether it's a crate.xml, signature.xml, or .lsh. Uh, based on that information, the receiver can calculate for itself that hash, or, or locally calculate that hash using the same al algorithm, presumably, that was used by the signer. Um, the receiver then um, pulls that encrypted or signed hash out of the signature file. It also pulls out the signer certificate, which includes the public key of the pair that was used to encrypt that hash. And then it decrypts that hash um, and then compares it against a locally created hash to determine if, in fact, that part was uh, signed or, you know, that hash was encrypted with the, you know, who who the receiver thinks is the originator of the software part. Um, the receiver also uses that signed certificate, which has a reference to the certificate authority or the trust chain embedded in it, to verify that that is a valid certificate, that, that, that it works its way up the trust chain or back to the certificate authority to verify that that certificate authority did issue that uh, signer certificate to the signer who we believe we're receiving the part from in the case of the receiver. So that's how uh, parts are signed. That's how the signatures are verified. Uh, we talked about uh, NEC a, a little bit previously about trust chain in here. Um, you know, we're saying after you um, compare the hashes, you also, the receiver has to do the step of ensuring that that certificate is valid and came from you know a valid certificate authority and hasn't been compromised. So enter the trust chain. What the trust chain really is and how that process occurs is really by traversing a hierarchy of um, signer uh, of certificates. So we talked about the signer originally gets a, a signer certificate by requesting um, a certificate authority. 
like I said, in these, in these diagrams, I just showed basically a root CA. The way it typically really happens is um, a signer will request a signing certificate from an intermediate certificate authority. Um, and what that intermediate certificate authority will do is they will create a, um, you know, the, um, the certificate file that has the name or identity of the, of the requester, their public key. Then they also put a reference to their name in there, and then they calculate a signature using their private key. <clears throat> um, and so then up the chain, that that um, that intermediate um, certificate authority, they have a signing certificate that they use to sign the requester's um, digital certificate that was created the same way with the root certificate authority. So they at some point in time requested a signing certificate from the root CA or the CA that's at the next level up the chain. Uh, and it was created in the same way that they created their certificate. So what happens at the receiver of a software part is they receive uh, this signer certificate in the software part. They have to have access to the referenced intermediate CA and so on and so forth up the tree in order to validate the authenticity of, of that uh, signer certificate and ultimately the identity of that signer. So that's that's what we mean by trust chain. Is It's the hierarchy of these um, referencing uh, digital signing certificates. Okay, so let's talk about how all this works in with actual Airing 615A load operations. So prior to loading a software part, um, the signed software part has to get transferred into the PDL. Um, PDLs that are operating in accordance with the, the latest security standards, they are not allowed to um, admit a PD, uh, I'm sorry, a, a software part into their internal encrypted storage unless they're, they're able to um, validate the digital signature of the signed part. So that's the first thing that has to happen is the signed part has to be presented to the PDL the PDL has to have access to the signer's trust chain, and, and then the PDL has to do the, um, the verification process that we described in this slide here. Once that completes successfully, then that software part um, with its digital signature is stored internally in the PDL in a protected area. Um, there is another Airing spec, Airing 645, that defines the criteria and the requirements for how the PDL must store. Uh, those signed software parts once they've been imported and their digital signature is verified. Um, mainly they have to be stored in an encrypted location and the encryption has to meet some minimum levels of requirements that are defined in the, the airing standard. Okay, so once that software part is now um, imported and in, in securely inside the PDL, it's ready and it can be selected for load operations by the operator of the PDL. But also to ensure protection against the case that somehow the PDL was tampered with or accessed and the software part was compromised, the PDL has to also verify that digital signature again every time before it starts a load operation. So um, the intent of the standard is for that digital signature of the signed software part to be verified as close to the time when the load actually commences as possible. Um, so what you want to do is minimize the amount of time since the signature was last checked and you're actually now transferring the software part over the wire up to the aircraft system. So that signature part is, that signed part is checked again just be prior to every load operation of that software part on the PDL. Um, now, the PDL does not transfer the digital signature to the aircraft system. So that's one key item to note about the current um, state uh, and uh, of the specifications and how this occurs. The target LRUs are required to know nothing about the digital signatures and are not required to do any authenticity checks with um, uh, uh, of the signed software parts. So the data loader actually strips the digital signature off and just loads the, you know, the raw uh, Airing 665 loadable software part to the LRU. 
So a little bit about how that upload operation um, proceeds. So once that software part is selected for load uh, and the operator of the, the portable data loader basically selects the part and hits the, the start button, um, the first thing that the data loader will do is it will uh, request to read an LUI file, so a file with a .LUI extension from the target. That indicates to the target that the data loader is requesting to start a load operation. The target will indicate whether it accepts that load operation or not within the contents of the LUI file. So the contents of that LUI file are specifically in, defined in detail in ARINC 615A. If the target indicates that it accepts the load operation in that LUI file, the next thing that the target side does is it starts up its status thread. So the way that an operation has to keep open between a target and a data loader is that the data loader expects to receive a status file. And in the case of a, uh, an upload operation, that status file has the extension .LUS. Um, the data loader expects to receive that periodically. There are specific timeouts set in the data loader whereby if it does not receive a status file within that timeout period from the target, it considers that the target has gone dead or gone off in the weeds, and it, it closes down the operation and, and basically ends in failure. So right after a target accepts a load operation, the first thing it has to do is start sending the LUS file to indicate status of the operation and that the operation is still ongoing on the target. It has to do that repeatedly until the end of the operation. On the data loader side, when it receives that first status file, the next thing it does is it sends an LUR file, which is a list of loads to the target. What that LRU file contains is the name of the header file, or in the case that the operator wants, of the PDL wants to load multiple loadable software parts in one operation, it would contain a list of the header file or LUH files of the LSP that the data loader is requesting to load to the target. <clears throat> the, the target, um, once it reads that LUR file, um, it will crack that open and it will pull out the list of header files. The most typical case um, is that there's one header file, it's a single LSP load uh, per operation with the PDL. Um, after that LUR file is read, what happens is while still simultaneously sending the, the LUS files, um, the target will first read that header file that was listed in the LUR file from the data loader. That header file, as we talked about uh, in one of the first slides, contains the part number and the CRC value calculated over all of the parts, uh, the constituent files, and then over all the files collectively. So the target side is able to then read each of those files by spinning through the file list in the header file. Um, it, it'll do read requests to the data loader. The data loader is, a, is basically a file server at this point. Then when each of those files is received, the target is expected to calculate the CRC of the received file and compare it to the CRC that's included in the header file and ensure that they match and that integrity of the part has been maintained. So that is how um, the integrity check happens all the way from basically the, the creator of the software part uh, providing it to the PDL, which can check the header file against its calculated CRCs, and then also the target can do the same checks. So integrity is checked on all steps along the way. Uh, but as I mentioned previously, the authenticity currently is not checked. There's no mechanism for, for pushing, there's no standardized mechanism for pushing and dealing with the, the digital signatures of the software parts on the target LRU. All right. Now a little bit of show and tell. I'm going to show an actual, um, some of these actual operations with our PDL application. So stand by one second while I get this going. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm actually um, running our PDL application on our laptop, the laptop I'm presenting from here. Um, this is the same application that actually runs in our PDL system. And I have my laptop connected to another system which is running uh, a simulated target. So it's just another PC that's simulating a target LRU. So the first thing is if I go in here, sorry, let me do some resizing since I'm not on the normal system. Um, and I'm going to select 
the target that I want to communicate with. So this BCG test LRU is the one I'm connected to. So I'm going to go make sure he's started here. Uh, okay. So I now have this uh, simulated target running over there. I'm going to do a find operation. So a find is just basically a query saying, hey, uh, BCG test, are you out there in, in data load mode? So I sent that find uh, request out, and we'll see if the simulated target responds. And he responded. Uh, it turned green, so it's indicated a response. So I can see that I have this BCG test or simulated LRU out there. Uh, the next thing I could do is I could proceed to the load operation. So here I would have to actually select a software part to load. I have not imported any digitally signed software parts yet, so my list is empty. So the next step, I'm going to step back to the very start. I'm going to actually transfer a signed software part into a staging folder. So the way that things work on the data loader is you can create a publicly available staging area where signed software parts are placed. And it's it's a quarantined area where the data loader is checking. Uh, it checks when there's a signed part there. It verifies the digital signature and the integrity of that software part. If it passes, then that part is pulled into the internal storage uh, where it's able to be selected for load operations. So what I'm going to do is now put a signed software part in the staging area on the data loader. So make sure I get it in the right area here. All right, so I've now placed in the staging area a part that can be used for that uh, simulated BCG test target. And you can see that the application has indicated that there's media or software parts ready for import. So I have it configured to, to require a manual import. Uh, we can also um, configure the application so that the part would be automatically imported. Uh, in this case, I wanted to make sure we kind of lockstep showed it. And you can see that the import uh, succeeded in the report here, and then we imported the software part with this part number. So if I go back now and select my test target to load, and I go to try to add a, a file, I can see that the part that I entered in that successfully passed the signature check is um, actually in the secure repository where I can, where an operator of the PDL can select part from. So I select that part, and now it's ready to load. I'm going to make sure my loadable target simulation here is ready for it. And it appears that it is, and uh, so I'm going to start the load. When I start the load, as I mentioned in one of the previous slides, um, the secure data loader requirement requires that the PDL software has to recheck that signature that was just checked when it was imported. So we want to recheck it just prior to commencing the load operation every time we do a load operation. So that's the first thing that's happened. And we can see with the green signatures here that the, the 665 CRC checks passed and also the signed uh, the digital signature passed and the load operation completed very quickly. It's an extremely small file so that the, the signature checks and CRC checks go pretty quick for demonstration purposes. Um, if we step on the actual um, indicator that it's a signed part here, we can show some information about the digital signature and the checks that happened and that it was the, the result was that it succeeded and also that the 665 header file CRC checks succeeded. Now, if I go back, I'm going to go back here, and I'm going to actually, over on the side here, I'm going to tamper with the software part. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to simulate this situation where this, the secure repository where the software part was, was tampered with, and an invalid part, you know, the part that's in there somehow got invalidated. So I'm going to put the invalid part in there. Oh. Okay, I've now corrupted 
software part that's in the secure repository. I'm going to select it again. And if I successfully copy the corrupted part in there, it's going to fail the signature check when we try to commence the load operation. And there you can see that the signature check failed. And if you step on it, it will tell you where it failed and why it failed. And you can see here that it says that the certificate was expired. So um, the certificate, I don't know if it's, yep, it's the signer certificate that was included. It has expired. So um, it, the software part is now considered no longer valid. So that's a little bit uh, kind of showing you the mechanism of how things work. I think primarily what a lot of operators of a PDL, what they want to know is, okay, when I go to this, these secure operations, what's different and how does it look different? Um, so what's different about it is um, the step where you see the indication to import the parts here, you don't get that if you're not in secure mode and not using digitally signed parts and not verifying the authenticity of the software parts. You're able to just go directly uh, to the, the load operation and select the part. So it's, it's a pretty small, um, pretty small difference. You just have to import the parts and then there's a check that's done each time before the part loads and there's the possibility if the part's been um, corrupted that the signature check will fail and you won't be allowed to load that software part to the aircraft. All right, so in summary, the key topics covered, and we talked about Airing 665 and uh, the mechanisms that that provides for integrity checks of software parts. We talked in quite a bit of detail about Airing 835 digitally signed parts, the three methods, the Boeing, uh, the Airbus, and the Carillon methods of digitally signing those parts, how to identify which of those methods would be used, has been used, and also some of the basics of PKI and key pairs, encryption key pairs, and how they're used to do the digital signing of the software parts. Um, and then we covered uh, what the PDLs have to do to receive, import, and verify those digitally signed software parts as part of their load operation and, and as part of the, the, the distribution of software from a supplier uh, to an operator onto a PDL through the PDL actually out to the aircraft system.